Hello everybody, welcome to Saving Grace Homeschool. My name is Leanne and today I'll be discussing the interactions and interdependence within the environment. The living organisms on Earth live and interact in different ecosystems around the planet. All of these ecosystems combined make up the Earth's biosphere. The ecosystem also consists of the abiotic environment, which is your non-living environment. Examples could include your rocks and your sand. And then you have your biotic, which is your living organisms. We have mainly to focus on biotic well, the living organisms, but now we will also touch a bit on the abiotic. Um, you have, you can have really small ecosystems or really large ecosystems. So the size of a real ecosystem is not defined by the area, but rather by the interactions that occur inside it. So if you have a large area and there are still interactions happening, that is still then an ecosystem. Examples of a small ecosystem can, could be a riverbank. And examples of a large one could be the Kruger Nat National Park, which is really massive. Apart from the recycling water, biotic and abiotic factors also interact to recycle carbon dioxide and oxygen in ecosystems, as will be shown here in this picture. You'll have your animals. They, carbon dioxide is released during respiration in your animals. Then over here, the carbon dioxide is used by the plants in photosynthesis. So the, um, the plants take in their carbon dioxide and then they use it to produce oxygen. Then that oxygen is used by the animals for breathing. So there you have that oxygen is used by plants during respiration, which is your breathing. Over here, you have that carbon dioxide is released from your decaying leaves. So decaying is uh, dying leaves. Over here, again, you have your oxygen from these aquatic plants. They are released during photosynthesis and they are available to underwater animals. So then the animals uh, take in the oxygen and they release carbon dioxide during respiration, which and then that carbon dioxide is available once again to that plant. So it's a whole cycle about the animals, both on the land and aquatic, they take in oxygen and they release carbon dioxide. Then you have that the plants take in the carbon dioxide and release oxygen again for the animals and so on. So it is a cycle. Different species interact in a ecosystem in many different ways. So let's just have a look for the different environmental interactions. You get abiotic which is your non-living organisms. Then with your biotic organisms, which is living, you get symbiosis, which is then further described, uh, well, it can occur in the form of parasitism, mutualism, commensalism. It can also go through competition and feeding. So looking at the first one, competition, this is where two species share a valuable resource. It can be food, it can be water, possibly even land, just anything that they compete with each other to obtain that. And then symbiosis, like I said, it can be, or it can occur in the form of parasitism, mutualism and commensalism. I will be going over that now. The first one is parasitism. This is when one species benefits while the other species is harmed in some way. Sometimes you can, the host will die. So an example is where with ticks, they are parasites. 
and they feed off the blood of many animals such as dogs, cows, buck and humans. So this is a harmful relationship where only one of them benefits. Then you get mutualism where both species benefit. So you say they are mutually beneficial. Here is an example of bees and flowers. So pollination is an example of mutualism as the bee gets food, so it gets nectar from the flower. And also now the flower is pollinated by the bee so that it can reproduce. So both species benefit from this relationship. Then you get commensalism. This is where one species benefit, but unlike here with parasitism, this one, the one benefits, but the other one is not affected in any way. So it is not harmed like the species is harmed in parasitism. And an example is that a whale shark with remora fish, the remora fish gets scrapes of food that fall out of the shark's mouth. But now the whale shark is unaffected because it's basically giving its leftovers to the fish and that way it's not, it's not losing anything in the process. The third one is feeding. This is when different species in an ecosystem are related and interact when one species can use the other species as a food source. So simply put, this is when one species eats the other one. And this is normally called your predator-prey relationships where the predator eats the prey. This uh, leads me now to the feeding relationships. You get two types of feeding types in a ecosystem. This is based on how the organism obtains its food. So you get producers and you get consumers. Producers, they are able to produce their own food. So they don't need any help from any other organisms. Producers are also called autotrophs. And the only types of producers that you get are different forms of plants or any plant tree that can photosynthesize is a producer. That was producers and now we have consumers which is also called heterotrophs. There are different types of them herbivores, carnivores, omnivores and decomposers. So just to recap, herbivores eat your producers. So herbivores eat plants. Then you have your carnivores, they only eat meat. So they can eat your herbivore or your omnivore. Okay, so those are animals that eat animals only. Then you get your omnivores. Omnivores eat both plants and animals and then your decomposers they break they eat on um well not eat they feed on organisms that are busy dying or decomposing in this section we will look more closely at the way in which energy flows from the sun to different organisms in order to produce support and sustain life on earth. When plants synthesize, they trap sunlight and convert it into chemical potential energy in food compounds. This energy is then available to animals where you have your herbivores that eat their plants directly and then you have your carnivores that only eat your animals for energy and then your omnivores eat both plants and animals for energy. So this is shown, this energy transfer, how it goes from um, the sun and the sun uses the plant, I mean uses, the plant uses the sun for photosynthesis, all of that is shown by a food chain, where a food chain starts by your plant. And then you can see what eats that plant, then what eats that animal. So that chain is shown by a food chain. Many food chains connected together form a food web. 
Then we have that animals that eat plant are primary consumers. Animals that eat primary consumers are called secondary consumers. And animals that eat the secondary consumers, which is mostly your predators, they are called your tertiary consumers. So it goes primary, secondary, and tertiary. And remember, that's consumers because they can't produce any of their own energy. Each level in the food chain is called a tropic level. So I'll go into that now. And then you have the organism uses up to 90% of its food energy itself, which means that there's only 10% left for the next animal that is going to eat it. So this is a, a food chain where it shows exactly what eats what okay so you have your sun you have your water and that is your producer which is grass then your primary consumer which is your grasshopper that eats the grass a snake which is your secondary consumer that eats your primary consumer then you have a hawk which is your tertiary consumer it's the predator that eats the snake and once the hawk dies then you have your decomposer, which is fungi, which feeds off on the dead bird. And then the decompos decomposer releases nutrients back that helps the grass grow. And then that's how the, the chain continues. And if you put now many different food chains together, you will have interconnected food chains and that is called a food web so this is just one if you've got many for example something else might eat that grasshopper then the minute you have more than one food chain it's called a food web in this section we will examine the balance between the different tropic levels in ecosystems so remember the tropic level if i just go back quickly just to explain each one of these are tropic levels because it is a different level in your food chain. So an area can only support a limited number of animals. It can't become too crowded because there isn't enough um, producers for the consumers to eat. So if we have a look at this picture, we have grass, then we have zebras and elephants. So the zebras eat the grass. The elephants eat the trees, then you have the cheetahs and the hyenas, which are your predators, and they eat the other animals. So now, if this becomes too populated, or if some reason the grass just doesn't grow anymore, then the zebras and the elephants won't have anything to feed on, which means they will eventually die because they aren't getting any food. And when they die, then your uh, predators have nothing to feed on, so they will also die. So the minute you're, the, there isn't any producers, the whole food chain dies out. But if you also lose like one of them along the way, it will affect the rest of the food chain. So that is why we need to have a balance in an ecosystem. Population growth is an important factor in an ecosystem. For example, well, that's basically what I was just mentioning on, uh, mentioning about. Then you have that human intervention can sometimes disrupt your population and eventually endanger your species. So once the species become endangered and die out, the rest of that food chain also die out. An example is of the riverine rabbit. There are less than 200 of them left in South Africa. Its habitat is very restricted because it only eats certain plant types. So it's, it's very picky and it lives in small areas of the Karoo. But during the day, it hides under bushes on the riverbanks, but many of its home areas have been invaded by humans or it has been destroyed. So 
we have destroyed its habitat so now it is struggling to find that food is struggling to survive adapt to the new conditions and then that is why it is now endangered so the main goal of any species is to reproduce and ensure the survival of the species so now with the riverine rabbit it is struggling to continue um, growing its population because there are factors beyond its control that is now influencing its ability. And these dis disruptions now cause an imbalance in the ecosystem, which will affect that organism. And not just the organism, but it will affect that ecosystem as a whole. There are two main factors that can disrupt a balanced ecosystem. The first one is natural factors and the second one is human factors. So natural factors, that is your natural disasters like any floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, droughts, anything that can now uh, damage the ecosystem completely. If the change occurs over long periods like climate change and global warming, the damage may not be reversible. There is some reasons why the dinosaurs became extinct. One theory is that there was a like a sudden change in climate when uh, a meteor uh, hit the earth, which then, because of the drastic change in climate, the dinosaurs were not able to adapt, which means and there was now a balance in the ecosystem. And that is eventually what led them to die out. Humans affect the environment in so many different ways. We completely destroy some ecosystems when we make way to build new houses, roads, buildings, cities. That's just one way we just completely destroy to make way. In there. We also pollute the environment with all our factories and when we drive cars and those are the main factors that cause pollution. And we also produce waste. And that's if you think about all the plastic and waste that gets thrown in the ocean, for example, or if you ride al along the roads, all that waste, it just gets left there. Another thing is that humans poach endangered animals and overharvest marine animals. So if you think about the rhinos, the rhinos are killed just because of their horns. So because they want the horn, they kill the whole rhino and then the rhinos can become endangered. So humans are a major factor that can um, disrupt our environment and cause disruptions to our eco ecosystem. That's all for this lesson. I will be continuing with another recording uh, on the same topic next time. Bye, everybody.